Thank you very much. Mukhtar, that was wonderful. That was wonderful. Thank you so much. Pleasure. Uh, Thank you so much. Levels of the nafus and all of the stages and the masalik and the masharib and the madahib and the madawik and all these things. Bless you. That's why Thank I love so hearing you speak because it, it just <laughs> makes you want to run. <laughs> <laughs> Not walk, run. <laughs> I mean, thank you. Platform. Thank you for setting up this really amazing platform. I mean, this is something I really think this is the way forward in academia, in 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 Islamic studies. Sorry, I don't want to meet, you know, keep on talking, but I just want to say the one thing to, yeah. to to offer my gratitude to the to the organizers and to the people who came and, and presented. Every single presentation was so unique and so enriching. And I think really this is a way forward when we have a complex between the theoretical, the practical, the contemplative, the, the experiential, um, and so many different things. We must include this all in our study of Islamic studies. It cannot just be intellectual history. So that's oh, yeah, a little piece. Absolutely. So thank you so much for, for setting it all up. Yeah, as there, there's that verse in this poem, to see this way as artifact and history obscures its lasting and profound mystery. Right. So the more we, you know, if we're just if, if we're just historians, really, and I will say something, I, I mean, I'm going to say something about this at the end, but, but it, it's pertinent now because you've raised it here. And I want people to hear these points. And Khalil Andani also addressed this, uh, this very issue this morning. I'm not I'm not uh, I'm not going to, you know, lay blame on anyone in our profession or our profession in general, uh, but it's a great disservice to a lot of people if Muslims begin speaking about their own tradition from their own perspective. A lot of people like to have us kind of not say these things. And there's definitely a politics involved with this, and we're all aware of what that is. We're a lot less harmful if we're just good historians, right? We're just, right? But, but I mean, we should also have, like every other faith community in the world, they should have a right to explain their own tradition from their own perspective. Um, I often I often uh, turn down offers to give lectures at for, or or be a part of projects like at Princeton recently there was one where Muslims were like an afterthought. It's like Jews, Christians, and Muslims on the divine, but Muslims were never consulted. We were just like thought of after. So we have to have that independence and that confidence and that awareness. I agree with you completely, and I think there's a critical mass for this now. There's so many of us working in these areas at so many levels. And uh, so, you know, may, may a conference like this may inspire other people to do their own thing. And may we have the opportunity to meet in person one day, inshallah. That's very, very important. We should all, we should have events like this as Mukhtar and I have been talking about in August for years now, in person. That's how we have to do it. That's the, that's the way forward. But let me, I have, a, I have a, um, uh, a large task ahead of me, which is that there are gonna be questions to curate and we're going to allow the speakers, the people who've already spoken, we're going to let them uh, uh, speak, you know, like uh, orally. And then anyone else who has a question, they can address it using the chat function. I'm going to try my very best to curate them. But before I do that, allow me to uh, make good on my promise because a few people asked questions during the sessions and uh, it would have been difficult to address them directly. And I'm going to do, I'm, I'm going to try to address them at least minimally right now and then hopefully this can uh, uh, you know help inform some of the discussion later and, and then each of you can weigh in so it's not you know what I say is not like the final word it's just the beginning of a much longer discussion uh, one person asked Muhammad Farooq uh, a question I'm just going to get to it uh, and it, it basically had to do with the difference between suffering that a believer would go through and that an unbeliever would go through so so that, that is to say, is the concept of suffering or punishment that's, self in, that's inflicted upon uh, an unbeliever, someone who doesn't believe in God, how is it different? And uh, the thing that occurred to me, and I would just leave, I, my answer to this would be this one verse from the Quran, uh, where Allah Ta'ala says, In takunu ta'lamuna wa innahum, fa innahum ya'lamuna kama ta'lamun, wa tarjuna min Allahi ma la yarjun, wa kan Allahu aliman hakima, that if you feel pain, Right, so you should know that they also feel pain, but just just as you do, they they feel pain just as you do. But you can hope from God what they cannot hope from Him, and God is all knowing and all wise. So we all experience pain, we all experience suffering, but the believer has the greatest fortress to go into—the fortress of the Shahada, the divine presence, 
that will protect them from the whole dunya and all of its onslaughts. And if you don't have that, what do you have? You're running around in a realm of suffering with nowhere to go. So that's all that I'm going to say, because that, that's the extent of my knowledge about, about this thing. The but, thing you know, I, sorry, just to yeah. know, uh, I, I also felt like that's an interesting question. It's tied to two verses from the Quran. Uh, and then so and then similar verses repeated elsewhere uh, so whatever good is coming from you whatever evil is coming from basically paraphrasing it's because of your own deeds and so forth and in another, another verse or in the same verse but if there's something good it's actually coming from god but if there's something evil that's coming because of your own deeds and so forth so is this is, does this sound Kind of fair to an you know an unbeliever, an atheist, or or is there kind of interpretation that needs to be done? How do you also inter interpret? Uh... Well, going on that verse, you know the 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 uh, you're right. Like the Quranic anthropology, it always throws it back on the person, right? You can call it what one sheikh once told me. He called it a Quranic karma, right? Where whatever you do, it's gonna rebound back on you in this world or the next world. Better off that it happens to you now because you're gonna be in a lot more trouble later. Um, and uh, if you think about it, right, like look at that one verse, right? So there's all of this facade, corruption that's occurring on the land and on sea. Why? Because of what people have done. We're the ones who've gone ahead and ruined our own uh, environments. We've ruined the world. We've ruined our own selves. Right? right? God doesn't wrong them at all. They wrong themselves. So I think that we should you know, push that inquiry and throw it back on ourselves. Human beings, we often want to give ourselves too much of the benefit of the doubt. And the Quranic conception is very different. It's, it, it's saying, look, if you, if, 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 if you find yourself in a difficult situation, well, rather than point that so-and-so and so-and-so in the politics and the government, and there may be factors which have put you in this un unfortunate situation, you may be totally innocent. But by and large, when you find yourself in personal problems, look back, and uh, ask yourself, what is it? How did I get here? How did I get to get here? But let me just uh, allow me to say one thing, Mohammed, because I think that I want to address the other question. I don't want it to get lost in the thread because a few people raise the same thing and they asked us specifically to address it. And then we'll come back to this one and then we can just open it up from there. Um, uh, uh, the, the, the question, I lost it, but I do remember what they were saying. It had to do with the qualifications of a sheikh. Now, this is not specifically speaking something that uh, we uh, should get into in great detail, just because I think it'll take away from a lot of the questions that still need to be addressed. But we can say a few things about that. Number one, that the Sufi tradition, the Islamic tradition, it itself has its own criteria of authenticity. Many of the great masters have spoken about this. Rumi, Ghazali, Ibn Arabi, you name it. Uh, in a most recent uh, discussion, I can, I'm going to draw your attention to a book that just came out by Enel Qazar Hamadani. In this text, he deals with the question of how do you distinguish between an authentic and inauthentic spiritual guide. And just like if I were to get my tooth extracted, I wouldn't just go to some dude off the street who just claims to have pliers and, and a good set of scissors. I'd have to go look for somebody with qualifications. So too, is there an internal mechanism in Ijaz's system, a system of authentication that is very much part and parcel of the Islamic tradition? Again, that's all that I'm going to put out there, but we can, we can use these two points just to kind of investigate uh, these issues and related issues that ne inevitably have come up and, and which we should also seek to address. So this is a good chance for anyone who's had questions to ask your questions to any of the panelists who are here. I should also like to say one thing Hina reminded me of. Uh, which is that our brother, dear brother, Olud Amini Ogunaike could not join us, um, but uh, he's very much a, a part of this conference and, and the foundational thinking that has gone into this, and he'll be, inshallah, contributing to the volume. And uh, his, uh, as they say in Persian, uh, I would say, I did say this to him already, Jayat Khalibud, you know, your, your space was, was empty, right? <laughs> um, so let's, let's keep it open, and, uh, and anyone who has your questions, you can just fired them off at me in the chat uh, thing and I'm going to try my best to curate them and as, at some points this is going to mean me also intervening on the on the responses and saying okay we only have like two more minutes here and we got to do this just to keep the discussion going and we'll go like this till about I would say 345 and then we'll uh, we'll have our, our closing remarks and
and say goodbye to one another for a short period of time. All right, so the floor is all of yours. Can I go? Uh, yes, Atif, go ahead. Uh, so I, I really, uh, Mukhtar, I, I really enjoyed your talk on Sufi psycho uh, psychology, sacred psychology of Islam. And my, my question is kind of dovetailing on the comment that Anthony Shaker, uh, Professor Dr. Anthony Shaker raised about the elements that control the nafs al-Mara bin Su and the role that the intellect plays. Because my understanding is, is that in the classical texts, uh, the intellect tends to be perceived only in a positive light. Whereas we see in the modern West, this hyper-intellectualization on the one hand, but no marif, no real, uh, we have a lot of pseudo-knowledge. So I wonder if you could comment on how the, the, how the intellect is perverted or what's the problem that perverts the, the, the intellect and what role the other elements of the soul play in the perversion of the intellect. And it would also be nice if uh, Dr. Anthony Shaker could actually comment because he's done a lot of work in this area and he's has some really good translations of Ghazali. It was a really, it was really nice to have him participate in this conference. It was a real honor for us, I think. Um, so that's my, that's my question. The intellect and its perversion, how does that happen? All right, uh, Mukhtar, where are you? Did we, did we lose you? Mukhtar is here. Are you, oh, he's muted. Uh, Luis, we need you uh, to intervene. Uh, that's, be, that's, that's, that's better now. Oh, is that? Okay, thanks. Okay. Um, okay, so, so the Hadith literature, and this is particularly prevalent in, in a lot of the, the, the Shi uh, Hadith on the intellect, but we won't get into the Shia Sunni aspects of it. We'll just talk about the, the fact that we have in the Riwayat, in both schools, that the, the intellect is being referred to the ruh, the aql al-awwal, or the awwalu ma khalaq Allahu al-aql, or the nur Muhammadi. So this aql, which is synonymous in various forms with, and if you look at Ibn al-Arabi, if you look at you know the, the followers of Ibn al-Arabi, they always talk about this aql is this ruh, this ruh al-a'zam. One of the aspects of the ruh is aql. So it's aql al-munawwar. The aql that we're that 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 Western civilization or modern modernity, what have you, uh, is is this hyper intellectualization is the shadow intellect. It's not aql al munawwar, not the aql which is guided by divine light or merged with with divine light. And so now we come to another term which is qalb. The qalb yafqah, and it says. So the qalb is an organ of vision and understanding. So the aql is one aspect of understanding and the qalb has another aspect or a deeper aspect. The aql has a qalb and the qalb has an aql. So both of these terms are interchangeable in the sources, um, in the literature. But what we, what we find now is, um, yeah, it's the, it's the role of the aql but it doesn't have, uh, may, it may be used in the shaitani sense, used to, um, to deceive. It's used, um, the, some of the functions of the aql are still there, say creating a, a nuclear bomb, um, you know, to create, uh, and we see this. So, so that requires a lot of aql, and modernity has a lot of aql, but it's not aql al munawwar, which is guided by light. So that's one way of looking at it. Uh, yes, I think Nicholas had. Yeah, go ahead. Nicholas, do you have a question? Thank you. I, I have a comment in response to the whole proceedings, but um, whenever whenever is appropriate, I can. Go, go ahead. You you go ahead. This is this oh. is your this is a you know it, it's 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 a session designed for all of us to just say what we want to say. All right, thanks so much. Um, I was, I'm def I've definitely been looking forward to this hour um, because I think we've covered so much over the last few days and really as other um, speakers um, have mentioned, I think we really achieved something massive 
um, in the last few days, both for uh, the state of Islamic studies, but also simply for the question, the human question of what is suffering and how do we deal with it? So I think this is a really important time to, to sit with what everyone has accomplished, these really remarkable uh, papers. Um, and I just had a couple of reflections just to kind of bring together a few things that I'd noticed um, that when you put them all together, um, what we have um, achieved. Um, so first of all, a point um, that perhaps Professor Ogunaike would have spoken more about and, and he certainly missed here is that uh, he's been speaking a lot recently about decolonizing the academy. Um, and I think this uh, conference was a brilliant example of that, where the, where the center is the Islamic tradition and the responses of that, rather than um, simply the responses being somehow peripheral to the central study, which is history or, or perhaps Christian philosophy of religion. So I think we've achieved something um, that really uh, amazing, uh, but also, um, the second point I would say is has been how when we put all the things together, how holistic, and again, I'm, I'm simply echoing what a lot of people have said already, how holistic this process has been. Um, and there's kind of three ways that I felt that um, all of the papers, when we put them together, um, and there's so many examples, I, I won't mention names, but I think it'll be pretty clear where everybody fits in this, is that we kind of have three dimensions of polarities going on. As I, as I see it, um, and I don't wanna make distinctions of, of separate boxes, but actually like a, a spectrum of different points of focus. Um, so the first one is that for me, um, the, I really gained a lot of clarity here about what the questions are. Um, and one of them is the, is the, you know, the classical question that, that C.L.S. Lewis was dealing with and um, um, how can there be suffering when there's a good God? That, that was the straightforward one. But of it also it came clear that it's actually a separate question that's deeply related to that of how we deal with suffering, either our own on those of others. So those two questions, they're separate questions, deeply interrelated. And I think many people, different papers focused on each one, but, but, but having those separate in our minds um, and realizing that the approaches may be, may be different and interconnected is useful. Um, and, and my second point was that the speakers laid out different resources for, for dealing with both of those questions. One of those um, is to use the mind, to use the intellect, um, and a number of different speakers laid out a correct vision of reality and Islamic metaphysics to make sense of, question, of these questions. And that obviously deals most with the first of those two questions. And the second is using the heart through compassion and love. And that also deals more with the second set of questions. But again, it's a polarity, it's not a separation. So for example, Justin's uh, talk his idea of gnosis is knowledge of the heart, even though it was a metaphysical intellectual explanation, it's, it's, uh, it's not simply conceptual, it's heart knowledge. And likewise, for example, Elia's um, description of, of guiding students through these challenges um, was a was a act of compassion in the heart, but it was based on this a kind of intellectual vision. So that integration of the two, I think has been very profound for me. Mm. Um, and then the, my, my third point is, is in a sense, um, setting out how, um, if we're in these questions, because perhaps I think in many ways, there's many aspects of the problems that people have solved. Uh, I don't think it's one of those. I mean, people will say, oh, that's the problem of suffering. You'll never solve that. I think actually there's lots of great solutions here. But I wanted to, to kind of um, separate into, again, a polarity two approaches, which is one cultivation of modes of understanding, um, which is related to the mind, but not quite in that all our speakers um, presented philosophical, literary and imaginative modes where we can use the mind in these, in these three ways, the philosophical, the literary and the imaginative, but also responses in terms of modes of being. And this is probably the most important response in that even when we've solved the problem on our mind, on the level of the mind, we still have to be transformed. Our mode of being has to be transformed. And several speakers, Hina, um, uh, Atif, Mukhtar, spoke about cultivating the virtues, cultivating compassion, and also saluk. Um, 
So I just wanted to use a few minutes for myself to, to kind of map things out so that when I walked away from this conference, I'd have some yeah, ideas nice. to kind of fit things around. Um, it's excellent. You know, in many ways, you know, like, you know, at the end of conferences, like, like, like someone has to come up and like summarize all the, <laughs> you did such a good job. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> you saved us from Muhammad Farouk and I at least five minutes of, 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 of uh, heartache and headache. And you said it much better than I could have said it. Exactly. You summarized the, the, the discussions and the connecting threads so well, but also discussed some of the potentials and promises uh, here for, for, for all of us, those of us who are actively engaged in the you know, study of Islam, those of us who are interested in it, and those of us who are not necessarily in the academy, but working uh, in different areas of life, all of which uh, you know, um, can be informed by the discussions uh, that, that have taken place here. I wanted to just, uh, mention one thing, um, kind of, it's, it's something that occurred to me while, I think it was Atif who was asking about the intellect. And uh, he asked Mukhtar this question about, you know, if you look at modern, let's say the modern academy, where you have this whole, um, you know, discussion of like ratiocination and it's like, it, it becomes very heady. And, and often students come to me and they're like, like, well, what's the point of all this? Who cares about all these things? And, and, and so there's, there's, there's two grades there of, of reality from which they're removed. One, it's alien discussions because 95% of the time it's based on Eurocentric theorists who have no relevance to many of the lives of the people who are reading this stuff. Like myself, when I was a graduate undergrad, I was reading philosophy, I was reading Nietzsche, I was reading Sartre, and I said to myself, these are my problems. None of these are actually, I'm, I'm, I'm not feeling alienation. I don't feel angst. I don't, sure, I want to sit in a coffee shop, but I don't feel any of these things. This, this is not my problem. This is somebody else's problem that's been given to me. Um, so then I started thinking, you know, like, what, what are our resources? So I try to expose students, as I'm sure all of you do, to just, you know, just, just look at the, the, the registry of world knowledge. Don't just limit it. That's one thing. And this, this, this should be done in every domain of life. But the other part of it, I think, is this kind of understanding that once you've discussed something theoretically, regardless of whether or not the concept is intelligible to begin with or not, but just if you've just done that kind of intellectual work, somehow you resolved a great mystery and you've given answers. I remember many years ago, there was a medieval philosophy conference that I had to go to and I had to introduce uh, the speaker or something like that. And I sat through this conference, halfway through, I thought to myself, what am I doing here? And, and I mean, the, the, the topics were very interesting. I'm trained in, in you know, these, these, these areas. So it wasn't like I felt alienated from a subject level. I just felt like, like how many times are you gonna beat around, beat this dead horse? And I remember walking out and someone said to me, where are you going? And I said, well, I have to go home. But in my mind, I thought what I really need to do now is I need to go pray. That's what I really needed to do. That was the only solution that I had. Um, so I find that uh, in, in the sapiential tradition in Islam, of course, you have all of these discussions about intel intelligence, cultivating the heart. But probably the, the greatest of them is this one by Mahmoud al-Shibistari, which speaks so well to our current problem here. I'm going to try to remember it. Right? How many a fool is there who goes around looking for the manifest sun in the middle of a desert on a bright day with a candle in his hand? And, and <laughs> so let us have that inner illumination is what is, is one of the messages that I think has come across very clearly here in these in these discussions. We should seek that inner knowledge and that will inform our intellectual understanding. You don't lose, like one sheikh once told me, you don't lose your intelligence. Like you gain it at a much higher level. So it's not like, you know, these, these discussions are unintelligible. I've seen the most uh, sophisticated intellectual discussions these last few days at a very, very high level. But that wasn't divorced from, as Nicholas was saying, from the knowledge of the heart. So that's just a kind of brief reflection that, that, that I wanted to share with you. Um, I see Justin has a question or comment, and as does Joel. So Joel, we're gonna we're going to uh, ask you to speak first. Okay. Um, one of the questions I, I sort of missed some of Muhammad Mansuri's talk, which I wanted to catch. Um, basically, one of the things I really struggled with with the problem of evil is the whole idea of predestination and free will. And in the sense that I feel like the Mutazali, uh, Mutazali were struggling a lot with 
trying to reconcile evil with free will. And one of the things I notice about Sufism is it's very predestinarian in its outlook, like in the sense of everything connected with God's names, um, all the events of the world connected with God's justice and mercy. And I wonder like how, what you think about like these aspects of what Marilyn McCord Adams calls horrendous evils and the notion of everything uh, as a relation with God's names. Um, sometimes I struggle with this question and I'd be really interested to see what um, some of the panelists have to say about that. Well, any, any takers? A very, very good question. Um, I can take that because I did mention, I don't know whether you're present, uh, but I can share the paper with you, the, the in, in instance of these horrendous evils uh, and, the, and the all pointless evil. Um, so, I mean, not to repeat everything, but you know those cases that we we meant incidentally it's also related to maybe what Muhammad, uh, Professor Rustam was saying about uh, the, those Quranic verses because sometimes you do have these cases you know these cases of people uh, innocent people you know children being raped you know horribly and, and so forth and animals you know going through this painful death and so forth and you do wonder uh, what is gained spiritually uh, it may especially for that person. So if people invoke like Khalil did or, base, uh, or, or other Christian theologians like John Hick, like you know, theodicy or suffering has a kind of soul making purpose. It makes the soul and we have you know, heard this few number of times, but what was gained in those cases where you don't seem to see any kind of soul making process, process, uh, process happening. So I think those are difficult questions. But my humble take is, would be to point to those stories in the Quran, uh, the Mo Moses and Khidr. Um, so we have a situation where a prophet of God is accompanying someone, and this in you know, apparently uh, Khidr, uh, and, and that person is killing an innocent boy, and, and Moses was enraged and so forth. But the answer is given that you never know what's going to happen to this boy later on. He's going to be a tyrant. He's going to make life miserable for his parents, but God is going to... Uh, replace, give them this, you know, his parents a better uh, child instead of this one. So that, you know, that can be a, a response, I think, because we never know, who knows, who knows what's going to be, but again, you think about the innocence case and you think um, it's, it's not me, but then the other option would be to also look at materialist ontology, as I was talking about, you know, let's just forget that you know, the, you know, all of these religious traditions have no satisfactory response. Let's turn our uh, attention to evolutionary process, the random process, which is simply blind, indifferent, and so forth. There, you can simply say it's just unfortunate, and you can even point to even more horrible cases. I personally have seen or been involved in so forth, not just those two cases that Roe mentions. So, I mean, so it's, it is even more difficult because in this materialist ontology, you have no con conception of eternity because in the, other, in the, in the sacred universe, uh, you have to take into consideration the total cycle, pre-existence and post-existence. We never know, we are not able to see, we don't, most of the time we don't have immediate knowledge of the life cycle of a given entity or individual. Um, and, and then you can always ask why even then, you know, in this, in the case of a five-year-old, uh, why did God have to punish her this way or that way? That question brings back the question, why is there a world? That, because this assumes that you know, it has to be purely custom-made so that there's no imperfection, no pain at all and so forth. But I think we have addressed that question uh, enough. But anyway, this is my humble take. It is a difficult question. Good, okay. Um, so I have things, I have questions coming in, but before I attend to them, allow me to uh, give the mic to Justin Jansadera. He has a comment or a question. Just um, very briefly, because I want to let anyone who's not one of us who has questions to be able to ask them. Um, when I raised my hand, it was just sort of listening to you and um, Professor Boylston speak just kind of prompted a thought in my mind. Um, I don't know about the rest of you. Um, I guess it depends on how many of the talks you were able to attend, but even um, people like us who are, you know, 
reading a lot, thinking a lot. By the end of three days, I feel mentally kind of exhausted. Um, and that kind of, when you were speaking, Professor Rustam, about, you know, this isn't our problem, um, like you get to a certain point um, where you kind of, I anyways, had this very concrete feeling of just uh, like the degree to which these sort of objections proceed from just a profound heedlessness. Um, because um, like at the end of the day, and this isn't an answer for someone who's not <laughs> presupposed to find it uh, compelling, but it just is what it is. And the human being, you just have to accept it. And if that's difficult for you to do, then, you know, for God's sake and for your sake, try to try to force yourself, fake it until you make it. And um, so I, I was just kind of having that feeling like even even in my case, I love metaphysics. <laughs> I love learning. I love books. But you get to a point where just, you know, you're you can't just being trapped in your head, like by yourself and not having an opening out <laughs> onto something higher and more real and more lasting is um, it's a sobering great point um, excellent point. Uh, um, go ahead this oh me. just just very briefly um um uh, going back to joel's question and just to kind of compliment um what dr farouk said um the the kind of um when it comes to really like horrendous crimes perpetrated by humans like the basic answer for that is just that human beings are free so of course they're not absolutely free because only god is absolutely free so that would be sort of the first place your mind goes and then you can ask oh well why did god make humans free and there's all of the resources that you can draw upon from the the tradition and the quran and hadith and things like this um but from a purely metaphysical point of view god knows all things his knowledge doesn't change so whatever knowledge he had of the human being prior to creating the human being um was was what it was um and um so for for crimes i think that kind of that's a one two punch or at least it's two keys that can um be contemplated and then for, I was trying very clumsily during my talk when someone brought up the question of the fawn, and I was thinking about it a little bit more. And it's very difficult to home in on a, a concise sort of um, formulation. But what I was gesturing toward, I think, was um, I started with kind of this broader context. And if the fawn is much closer to the human state than you know a rock, and the human, for all the reasons that have been given throughout the talks, must suffer. Um, that's just part of the picture, then the fawn must suffer in so to the to the precise degree that it participates in the reality of man. So in a lot of cases, it's very, you know, kind of comprehensible where this is just part of the rhythms of nature and, you know, the, the, um, the, the food chain and things like this. And then insofar as you have these sort of imaginative, you know, exceptional examples of, oh, it gets pinned under the tree and it's burning for, you know, five hours until it dies. In that case, the exception doesn't gainsay the rule and one can always fall back on um, sort of what Dr. Farouk was saying, which is just, you know, um, the, the total picture is not available to the human being as such. And you can get remarkably that the human mind is, um, is incredible. And it's amazing how satisfied you can be on that level. Um, but definitely there's no escaping. Um, I forget which speaker, uh, it was Dr. Latif um, mentioned the very crucial notion of haira, of bewilderment. And um, that's always, you can't, can't forget about that. <laughs> so metaphysics is, you know, is beautiful. Um, but there's always, at the end, there's always the haida. That's, that's yeah. the, that's the upshot, the final upshot of your finitude. Yeah, what does Hazrat Mawlana say? Ziraki befrush o heirani bebechar. Ziraki zannast o heirani nazar. Right, sell cleverness, this cleverness of the dunya. And purchase instead bewilderment, heira, right? Because cleverness is just zan, it's just conjecture, whereas heira is true vision, as a. So, actually, to remind myself, I have that quote on my door in my office in Ottawa. And <laughs> it's there just before I get in there. I always try to remind myself of that. Um, Almar, you, you had your hand up. 
Yeah, thank you. Uh, th this is in response to uh, Justin's first uh, thought about how even a beautiful conference with such wonderful people uh, who are as interested in speaking from, you know, uh, deep engagement um, with the topic, can one bring oneself to a state of uh, almost exhaustion, right? And I've always felt that about academic conferences. I think uh, Nicholas Boylston talked about that, you know, there's a crack nickel i think that was the quote right <laughs> everything needs a crack from which the light comes in i think academic conferences from my perspective are in fact the koan for all of us which finally exhausts us so that we actually see the limitations of the mind and can just finally surrender <laughs> those who have been blessed or cursed <laughs> with eyes that seek all of these answers <laughs> that was just my comment <laughs> that, that's that's lovely <laughs> Yes. Anybody else? Uh, does anybody have a, a point that they like to, um, to, to raise? Okay, um, Mohammed and Mansuri, maybe you can go. And then after that, it'll be Cyrus. And then and we'll just keep it going like that. Oh, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Ahead. Yeah, I just uh, wanted to also like... Uh, uh, echo what has been said in, in a sense that I think a lot of us also are afraid of the revenge of academia in many ways and uh, what it means to sort of like also like you know thinking about what sort of training that we receive like how we are kind of like wired to think about Islam and you know in, in, in the training that we get in writing that we have how we write how we are allowed to sort of like think about that so in that sense I think uh, this conference has been kind of like really amazing opportunity to, to push that. And then also as, 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 uh, as, as uh, Nicholas also said, like, like connecting that to the field, right? So it's not so, like, it's not going beyond field, but also it's going back to academia and deconstructing what, what is happening in academia, because this is academic conversations also about Islamic studies and it had to be part of the field. It's not, again, a conversation that is happening among some Muslims, but it's an academic conversation and it's part, a legitimate part of that. So making that change, I, I think, and, and in, in a way, having that courage to think about that uh, uh, with, without sort of like fear of that revenge, of that, uh, what, what, what other people think of my work, and then there's politics of race as well, you know, you know thinking about that again, I, 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 like, you know, I'm, I'm kind of like, again, thinking about the brown Muslim or the academia. Again, I am already kind of labeled at not, you know, being an original yeah, thinker. So I, I just don't, don't have that already. There are a lot of like, you know, that like, you know, so that's exactly uh, gender as well. And also like uh, yeah, politics yeah. of gender. So they're all yeah. sort of like, I think, modes of oppression that are happening and then, and then makes us scared. And also with pandemic, going back to pandemic, I had conversation with people who just started their PhD and how they are much more isolated and lonely because then there is no community and everything is online. People are scared again. That even makes it for next generation. I think pandemic makes it a real threat for next generations of yeah. scholars of Islamic yeah. studies without having that community. In Department of Religion, Religious Studies, it's much more problematic because like it's not Christianity. And I mean, religion is not Christianity, Islam. You're doing Islam, you're already isolated in religion department because you're not part of. So uh, how much also pandemic also makes that, I think challenging for next generations and how like these opportunities are quite important to create that sort of like community that encourages like thinking yeah. about. Bismillah. Sorry, sorry. I, uh... Can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was having some technical difficulties, but you can hear me. Okay. Uh, I just wanted to thank everyone. I thought it was uh, amazing. Uh, the comments have also been great. Nicholas Mukhtar. I, I wanted to make one small comment, which is, um, you know, if you remember in Khalil's paper, he was talking about how in a lot of the texts we read, suffering comes up, but there isn't a designated section because for the most part, I think if we're being honest with ourselves in a lot of these classical sources, it just wasn't as big of a deal as it is for the modern person, the issue of, of suffering. And it's becoming a big deal. Like when you, if you start hanging around with Muslim youth, the, the question of suffering is becoming important. But I was thinking, 
I think there are ways also to extend our discussion of um, of suffering to questions that we do have uh, and we have had. Um, one of them that came to mind, and I, I would have loved to hear like responses from everyone on this, is uh, the question of sacrifice, like sacrificial animals especially. So if you look at like um, the case of, uh, of Ismail, Wafade Nahu, right? We we ransomed him with, you know, it almost, I mean, it, it almost seems in some of these cases, and it, I know it's true in the Jewish tradition and the Christian tradition, that someone has to suffer, and then it becomes sort of passed down to, to, that, to that animal. You know, I'm not saying that the animal suffers in, in death, or it shouldn't be a, a humane death or anything like that, but I just wonder if we couldn't have, if we couldn't maybe in the future or someone could respond. I know now we're out of time, but, but there's, there seems to be something to that. The idea that, um, that, that, you know, this, this suffering, it almost has to happen on some level, or you'll see this often with like the evil eye where someone, like, you know, they'll say, well, uh, you know, this thing broke, well, it protected you from that suffering because this thing broke. The evil eye sort of landed on this. I don't know how much of this theologically is grounded, legally is grounded, metaphysically is grounded, but it's something that Muslims practice and believe in. So I just wanted to bring that up. Yeah, very good. So uh, thank you very much, Cyrus, for that uh, observation. It's wonderful. And he's done some of uh, this, this, this work addressing these contemporary things in his book, um, uh, The Polished Mirror wherein he addresses ethical questions through the art of storytelling, but really relates them not just to classical text, but also contemporary concerns of the just and the good. So um, does anybody have a question or a comment? Yeah, just a follow-up comment on what Sarah has said. And I think Justin has, I, I can go after uh, Justin. I think Justin. Yeah. Go, Justin, yeah, go ahead. Uh, oh, it, it was just very brief before, after, um, when Professor Ali was speaking, um, it just reminded me that um, this is just an idea for an article for anyone who has the time or the willingness to do it, but, or maybe something like this exists and I haven't seen it, um, but just a paper dealing with the question of scholarly objectivity. Um, and I've seen, like I did a very preliminary web search and I saw some material out there that, you know, tries to problematize the sort of commonsensical notion of what modern Western academic impartiality uh, means from different points of view. So there's, there's stuff out there, but just uh, something from a Muslim voice, um, like I'm thinking of a journal like Renovatio or, or others, it would be nice to see something like this because obviously um, there's something lacking <laughs> and uh, what so often passes for scholarly objectivity and disinterestedness. Um, so just just a thought, maybe I'll try to do something like that, but any of you I'm sure would be able to write something wonderful uh, on this, what I think is an important topic anyways. I'm sure many of you would agree. That's it. Yes, yes, indeed. Um, there is a question here. Um, some of our friends are, are signing off because we're coming close to the end. Uh, but there is one question that came earlier, uh, which we never got to. Um, I think it was by Rose, if I'm not mistaken. It says, how does one cultivate the heart vis-a-vis -vis the soul? How does one cultivate the heart vis-a-vis -vis the soul? So uh, would anybody like to uh, take that one? Can I throw it at somebody? <laughs> Just <laughs> pick. <laughs> uh, Atif, yes, go ahead. Go ahead, Atif. Are you are you muted? Okay, let me ask uh, Luis to. Uh, okay, unmute. I think I'm muted now. Can you hear me? Yeah. Well, you know, Ghazali in his book of the marvels of the heart, uh, uh, that's a book that's worth reading to answer the question. And he explains how these terms, they have multiple meanings. And sometimes they refer to the same thing from a different vantage point. So Ghazali says that, for example, the aql, the ruh, 
and that's what Mutmana uh, are referring to the same thing. Like there's a kind of convergence in a realized soul. I mean, uh, Mukhtar pointed this in his talk as well on the overlap between the qalb and the ruh, that they're really the same thing and how the ruh and the nafs almost become identical when the nafs is purified. So I think some of this has to do with just understanding the range, this, the polyvocality of these terms, how these terms are used in the sacred psychology of Islam. I think that's really, that's how you're going to answer that question. How yeah. does one cultivate the heart with respect to the soul? And try to understand what terms actually mean in their different contexts. And I think Ghazali in the Marvels of the Heart really does that in a single text. Right, he gives it out. Oh, yeah. Um, uh, Melanie has a question. So thank you, Arthur, for that. Melanie has a question uh, for Justin. Uh, but why is such detachment a virtue? She's asking, uh, under normal circumstances, I cannot disinterestedly contemplate a boot on my neck or a gun to my head, just as I cannot take on nonpartisan stance of philosophical reflection vis-a-vis uh, -vis white supremacy and so on and so forth. So what she's asking uh, about is, uh, you know, basically, as the first line of the question says, why is detachment such a virtue in this way of addressing this? Sorry, it just got to a quote uh, answer. Oh, Melanie says, so M Melanie, is that your question here? Uh, why is virtue such a, such a, uh, why is detachment such a virtue, excuse me? Oh, it's a quote, I see, okay. Oh, this is from Odu Daimini, all right, okay, I get you. All right, yeah, I was wondering, I'm like, that, that sounds, that sounds <laughs> familiar, kind of, okay, right, gotcha. Um, and I, th I believe that very paper you're quoting from, I think we shared it a little earlier, if that's if I'm not mistaken, you know, somewhere up there. Ah, I don't write that well. No, you do. Are you kidding me? You're a very good writer. She's being humble. <laughs> um, all right. So uh, let's see here. Are there any other questions? Or we have about five minutes before we uh, move on to the very, very last bit. Of, of our conference, which is the formal goodbyes. Uh, thank you very much, Kristen, for, for attending. So just appreciation and love coming through the chat, which is what I'm, like I said, I'm gonna curate this for all of you, but you can read the, the comments yourselves if you like. And we can take a few minutes. Uh, if you have any last thoughts, questions, concerns. Technically, you have about four minutes. If you don't, we can just we can just move on to it. It's no problem. You know, there's that saying, "All good things uh, come to an end," but that's not the way the Sufis would look at it. Right? All things that are perceived as good come to an end, but what comes from the all good never comes to an end. So this is the beginning of openings. It's not an end to anything, actually. Um, all right. Let me see. Something else did come in the. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, all right, uh, I think what we're going to do is we're going to we're going to move on into the last bit of our conference, which is the formal goodbye part. <laughs> now, uh, I, I did I was thinking of you know what to say because well I, I felt that there had been so many wonderful summaries as the conference moved along that uh, I thought maybe at the end maybe I can say one or two things that tie all the threads together. But all of you have done this work for me in many ways. And then Nicholson, that was like, uh, Nichol, sorry, Nicholas, I keep calling you Nicholson because, uh, you know, we're, that must not be saying we're, <laughs> this is the second time I'm calling you Nicholson. Um, that's an inside joke. Uh, but, um, but Nicholas, you know, it was a Shah bait, really. He just, just summarized it so well that, um, that I don't really feel like I, I, I should have anything else to say. But um, when I was thinking about, you know, a text that I could perhaps share with you, that really has spoken to us over the years that deal with the question of suffering and, and just the very uh, you know, question of our situatedness. Why are we here? What are we doing here? How are we gonna move along in life? I feel like I could do no better than quote a poem from Professor Nasser with you. Uh, you know, the conference began you know, with, with that uh, keynote of his and uh, it, it set the trend for the themes that would follow over the next few days. So I thought it's fitting to end with this poem uh, by him. 
uh, I should say that this poem of his, which is called uh, Why Here, Why Now, it was put to song by Sami Yusuf many a uh, few years ago. And I'm going to put in the chat function uh, the, the link to the YouTube video so you can, you can listen to that song that Sami Yusuf, he did a brilliant job. But allow me to read the poem to you. He wrote it, uh, the, the date here is June 25th, 1996. So a very long time ago. It's called Why Here, Why Now? It says, here I am at this place, at this time. But why here and why now? Why not in a clime more fair, resplendent with beauty, natural and human? Why not in times when men live centered, their vision, their vision fixed upon thy countenance, aware of the presence of the sacred near and far? Why am I in this place torn asunder by blight, shorn by the blades of inequity, drowned in darkness, immersed in the turbid waters of negligence and forgetfulness? Why at a time when men have lost sight of thy face, wandering ever faster and yet aimlessly in search of they know not what, while destroying the web of life itself, and all that might remind them of that radiant face. Question not the where and when, the hands of destiny for thee have chosen, causes beyond thy ken have placed thee here and now. Question not why, but understand this simple truth. Here is the center that is the center of all wares. Now is the moment at the heart of all times. To be here now with all thy being is to be in all those worlds and aeons of thy dream and beyond thy dream in that awakening from all dreaming. So remember, here is the center containing all here's and now the eternal moment containing all when's. Ask not why here and now, but be in the here and now to find the key to all existence, to taste beings alpha and omega, to experience not only in all the climes and times when she manifested the beauty of her face, but also the eternal knot beyond all moments of time, all stretches of space. Be here and now with all thy being and wonder not why. Thank you all very much. That's all that I have to say. And I will now hand the mic over to Muhammad Farooq to say goodbye. Oh, thank you so much. I don't think I have much to add, especially after this poem. Uh, so I'll just formally say goodbye. But it just reminded me of uh, saying to myself, actually, when we talk about these things, especially suffering, evil, everything looks very dark and gloomy. But we forget that life itself, the very moment itself, is a great gift. You know, because we can always ask that question, whether given all of this suffering, whether we want to exist or not. I think most people still choose to exist despite whatever qualms they have, whatever complaints they have. <clears throat> so it's really the big picture, everything that we have. We often seem to forget that, I guess, when we encounter you know, terrible things and so forth. So, uh, so it's, 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 it's a mystery. Uh, you know, it's, I, mean, why, I mean, why do we have this kind of world? I mean, even if one does not have any beliefs in it, still it's just inexplicable explicable uh, mystery. So I think, you know, there's a lot to kind of think about. So I would like to really, really thank all the presenters for all their insights and, and taking the time also to prepare and, and present. And also our wonderful audience um, from all over the world who have taken the time to grace us with their presence.